Under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelic X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. Hello, I'm attorney Gary Smith, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics, my ongoing exploration of the question of the law of psychedelics. Sure, Ira, you want to, uh, you want to lead off? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so my name is Ira Schwartz. I'm a lawyer here in Phoenix. I've been practicing law for, seems like forever. It's over 30 years. Um, I'm also a member of the Arizona Cannabis Bar Association, of which Gary is uh, the president, and I've been uh, somewhat active in that as well. And um, my, I have kind of my own little niche in the uh, cannabis bar, and it also is my larger niche in what I practice. Um, I prim- primarily practice in the intellectual property area, so I do a lot of trademarks, copyrights, um, anything high tech, anything to do with social media and any legal issues related to that. That's kind of my core practice. Um, Related to that, I do both transactional work and uh, litigation. So we've done our share of trademark infringement lawsuits and patent infringement lawsuits, copyright infringement and um, online defamation cases, all kinds of different things. It's usually a very interesting practice. Um, I find it especially interesting because um, in general, I am often dealing with very new technologies and uh, trying to make existing legal principles apply to technology that nobody ever thought about when they passed the laws. So that's maybe one of the more interesting aspects of my practice. Um, And the way I, my primary focus with the cannabis bar has been on the unique uh, issue that um, those in the cannabis industry face in terms of getting their trademarks protected. Um, It's kind of a sub issue that those in the marijuana business have particularly um, because uh, generally, um, while most of the states in the United States now have cannabis in legal in some form, um, on a federal level, it's not. And what that means is that the traditional way of getting your filing a federal trademark application and getting your trademark registered throughout the United States is just not available to those in the marijuana business, or at least not for the specifics of selling marijuana or marijuana products, because those are illegal on a federal level so the trademark office will not let you register those so we've done i've done a lot of advising uh companies in that niche about what they can protect other ways of protecting their trademark under state law rights and um common law rights and and what they can do on a federal level that still complies with federal law without being specifically marijuana related and so i do a lot of that um and in a nutshell that's kind of my focus on things Gary? Cool. Thanks, Ira. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Gary Smith. Uh, before I start talking, um, I've got my uh, lights circulating on the ceiling, specifically and intentionally for effect. Is it too distracting? Should I just put it on like a static light or we're good with the psychedelic effect? I'm, g- I'm getting Let's thumbs up thumbs on the up. psychedelic effect. Okay, good. That's consistent with the motif, so I'll, I'll leave it circulating. But if it becomes distracting, please do say something because it's just a button away to make that stop. Uh, anyway, so like Ira, I'm, I'm in the uh, law biz now for, oh gosh, 30 years as well. Um, I think Ira got started maybe just a couple of years before me. And uh, weirdly enough, we both kind of grown up in the Phoenix legal market and have known each other for damn near about 30 years now, Ira. Um, it's been that it's long. It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, he and I uh, knew each other back when we had hair and it had color. So that's, <laughs> that's how long it's been. Um, I have been on a slightly different track than Ira. My career has been really principally litigation. I have done certainly my share of transactional work, but it is by no meaning or mainstay the 
you know, me to my practice. Uh, it's really been litigation. And of that, the crazy part is for 30 years, a real significant part of my practice has been construction law, which is doubly weird when you also learn that my undergraduate degree is in English literature. So I can tell you a lot about Shakespeare and Chaucer and somehow I ended up doing construction law in Phoenix, Arizona. No, I can't explain it either. Uh, along the way, though, oh, now, I guess about 13 years ago, Arizona flirted for the second time with medical marijuana. Uh, many of you may not know this, but back in 1996, Arizona passed its first medical marijuana law, and our legislature killed it within months. So it disappeared from the scene until about 13 years ago. And 13 years ago, somebody had uh, started to pass around a new medical initiative, and there just weren't a lot of lawyers who were willing to touch it um, for a variety of reasons, ranging from they didn't think it would pass to they didn't feel ethically good about it or didn't feel morally good about it. Uh, let's just say cannabis and I have been lifelong friends, and I thought anything I could do to help a friend out, I was going to do. So I jumped in on the cannabis scene uh, with both feet happily. Uh, 13 years ago, and along the way, uh, started up along with a bunch of other lawyers, the Arizona Cannabis Bar Association. I've got the uh, banner here behind me. As Ira mentioned, he and I are, are both part of the association. I am one of the original founding directors and uh, do still wear the uh, president's hat in the organization. Um, the past 13 years has been really fascinating in the cannabis world. It has matured uh, in a very rapid and in many ways unusual fashion, it's going to continue to mature and warp. It's going 10 years from now to look nothing like it looks like today. So for those of you who are interested in careers, perhaps in law or in cannabis, Ira and I will take a stab at trying to predict what it looks like, but I am not highly confident that we'll give you really good answers, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. Uh, beyond that, I know because Caitlin's shared some of this detail with you, and, and for those of you who may not know this, Caitlin is my assistant. Uh, she works for me at the moment, and she's heading off to law school next year, so I'm going to be losing her in a year, uh, which, if any of you are paying close attention, means there's going to be a job opening with me. So just take that to heart. Um, but anyway, um, over the past few years, because of my cannabis work, I am one of these people who likes to know as much as I can about a topic. So I did a voracious amount of reading and self-education about cannabis, which if you read about cannabis, ultimately takes you down the warrens and avenues of other plant medicines. And I fell head over heels in love with the whole topic of psychedelics as a result. And um, coming out of that, I ended up authoring um, certainly the country's, if not the world's first comprehensive legal treatise on the law of psychedelics, uh, which is available on Amazon if you care to buy a copy. Uh, and then I was going to jump out onto this international lecture circuit for psychedelics when I got ready to publish the book, but that's right when pandemic started, which in turn explains why I've got uh, psychedelic lights on my ceiling. So pandemic started, I couldn't jump out onto uh, any kind of a book tour so I took the downtime in our uh, sequestration here at home and taught myself how to podcast. So I ended up taking a spare bedroom. I built a recording studio where I'm sitting in right now, and this is some of the background for the show. But I do a, a podcast that's hosted principally on YouTube, but it's syndicated through Anchor all over the world. And it's all about psychedelics with mainly a legal focus, but uh, really any topic related to psychedelics is okay by me. And I've had a variety of different guests on a variety of different topics on the show. Uh, beyond that, last year, I had some scraps left over from writing the first book. So I ended up authoring and publishing a second book, Psychedelic Arizona, which is a whimsical look at all things psychedelic connected to Arizona, also available on Amazon in case you care. Um, but that's kind of the short version of me. I'm 30 years in the trenches doing litigation. I, I'm just your run of the mill litigation attorney who um, just kind of does good at it. And I've got this vibrant cannabis practice that honestly, 10 years from now, I'm not even sure if it will exist. And in the meantime, I've got this weird little niche uh, hobby practice of psychedelics where I principally represent uh, psychedelic religious groups, but I also consult on a variety of different topics. So uh, I'll leave it there. Um, go ahead and start peppering us with questions, I guess, unless Ira, you've got anything to back up or say more. I was just, just going to add one comment. Yeah. Gary's being a little modest. Um, those lawyers who were at the forefront of the, the transition to marijuana were actually somewhat, were rather brave. 
Um, there was, you know, legal ethical issues and other challenges in starting those practices when it started. Um, there were questions about, um, you know, were you as a lawyer there were frost, you know, fostering somebody who's engaged in illegal activity? So um, it's now become much more mainstream. But but those who were there at the beginning, like Gary, um, did somewhat stick their neck out to to make sure the law moved in the right way and to protect some of these businesses that were really on, you know, the knife edge. Uh, the bleeding edge of um, where the law was going and, and helped shape it and bring it to where it was now. Hmm. That's that's very kind of you to say, Ira. Um, and uh, OK, fair, fair enough. Um, uh, on the list of credentials, then, if we're if we're really going to go there, <laughs> uh, I, I helped well, honestly, save the cannabis industry here in Arizona. Several years ago, uh, there was a, a very, very important case, the Rodney Jones case that went up to the Arizona Supreme Court. And we were on a team that was challenging a uh, trial court ruling that was upheld at the Court of Appeals that said all cannabis extracts and concentrates were not part of our Medical Marijuana Act and were illegal. At the time, the marijuana industry in Arizona was a half billion dollars. Now it's one and a half billion dollars. That's how big it's gotten. But at the time, it was a half billion dollars. And statistically, more than half of that was concentrate and extract sales. So all of your, you know, infused cookies, cakes, brownies, drinks, vape cartridges, all of that. Uh, in, in one shot, in one criminal case, the court declared all of that was illegal. And if that were upheld, that would have been the death knell to the entire Arizona medical marijuana industry. They would not have survived it. And I uh, helped get the primary defense appellate lawyer on on to help. And also I uh, represented the former director of the Department of Health Services uh, in an amici capacity. And we, in a very literal sense, save marijuana. So if you're, if you're smoking, pour one out for Rodney King and uh, maybe uh, tap an ash for me. All right. Now questions. Who wants to go first? There you go. And by the way, any, any topic, we know that you're all in college, you're looking at your futures, you're looking at careers, you're looking at life, uh, really any topic at all, nothing's off limits. And if we don't know the answer, Ira and I will be happy to make something up. This is Kate. Very awesome. So many good questions when I was there. So you better <laughs> ask the good questions too, because I know you all are capable of it. <laughs> well, you, you took the microphone, so you have to go first. Go ahead. Oh, I have to go first? There you go. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, that's not fair. Um, do you... Uh, do you see that um, students that are interested in cannabis, do you see that there's going to be a um, professional outlook for them? Or would you encourage them to go into different um, career paths in the field of law um, outside of cannabis? Would you encourage them to explore other practice areas? Um, and can you give your explanation as to how you are not a cannabis attorney, but you are an attorney who also dabbles in cannabis? <laughs> <laughs> I think she just accused both of us of smoking, Ira. So you go ahead and take that first. I'm, I'm going to take the, the last part of that first. Um, so, um, uh, well, I'm going to do both. So first of all, my general advice is there's lots of opportunities um, if in the cannabis industry for people who are not lawyers. Um, and there's lots of opportunity in the world for people who are not lawyers. So um, my general advice, and I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but is there are plenty of lawyers out there. Um, there's the world doesn't need, and this is going to sound bad to this group, but let me explain. Um, if you want to be a lawyer, then great. Go to law school, be a wonderful lawyer. The world needs more good lawyers. Um, but it, the, the world doesn't need more people who go to law school because they don't know what else to do. Um, so my suggestion is if you are passionate about the law or you want to use law to change the world, um, go to law school, become a great lawyer. Gary and I will be glad to hire you and let you run. And, and there's lots of other people out there who would love to see you. Um, but it's, you know, there are plenty of other ways um, to contribute to the cannabis industry, if that's what you're passionate about or whatever you're passionate about, you should pursue that. Um, that's in my experience. Um, you know, there's a lot of lawyers experience burnout. Those who love what they do are less likely to do that. So, um, you know, if you're passionate about law and, and I don't think you're here otherwise, then go to law school and, and there's lots of resources to help you become a great lawyer. Um, if you're not sure, then explore and find out. Um, 
and hopefully we can help you answer some questions to help you find out. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything Ira just said, especially the part about it, it, passion. Uh, don't, don't go to law school because you just didn't have a really good plan A or a plan B. Um, I can tell you I am the poster child of people who went to law school as a plan B. Um, I didn't intend to practice the deal. And in this, um, by the way, I'm being very honest with you right now, so I'm not kidding here. I, I have an undergraduate degree in English literature. I knew in college I wanted to go further with my education. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. And at, you know, senior year got started, I started to look at two possibilities. One was a PhD track, and I was looking very seriously at going PhD. And the other was a law degree. And my calculus was nothing more than me ultimately realizing if I went to the PhD track, it would qualify me to say really esoteric things to people like, would you like fries with that? So that was pretty much what made me decide to go to law school. I didn't have a burning, abiding, a passion to be a lawyer. Uh, 30 years in, I still don't, to be very candid with you. Uh, I, I went because I just didn't have a better idea. And I never intended to practice. I thought I would go get the degree. I wanted more education. And I thought that was a good in and of itself. And I was content to do that. The problem was I was signing these promissory notes for the student loans. And when you are doing that, you know, they're very eager to have you sit down and financial aid and sign papers, but they're very slow to tell you what the effect of that is going to be on your life. And sure, I went through law school. I actually ripped through law school in two years instead of the traditional three. I was lucky to go to a school that offered a trimester system. So instead of taking summers off, I just stayed in school. But at the end of two years, you know, your, your loans go into repayment. And I didn't have a job yet. I hadn't taken a bar exam yet. And suddenly I'm having to stroke checks to pay off a $100,000 student loan, which that's money 30 years ago. Today, for you, that's going to be a $300,000 student loan or a $400,000 student loan. So yeah, I was feeling the effects of that. And resultingly, I ended up going into law practice and ultimately staying in this because it was what paid the bills back then. And, you know, I just kind of got stuck in it and made peace with it. And it's okay. I'm not complaining. Don't take this the wrong way. But I was not a person who came about this from deliberate intention. I more stumbled through it and into it and I got lucky. Here I am. Uh, but don't do as I do. Take me as a cautionary tale, not as a model. Okay. So I'm going to jump in on the opposite. I, you know, from early in high school, I argued with everybody about everything and sometimes just for the purpose of arguing. I like being right. I like to win an argument. I still do. And now I get people who pay me for that. So it's great. I get up every day and I'm doing most, you know, 99% of the time I'm doing what I want and what I like to do. Um, and, and it's great. In terms of, um, I want to go back for a second, though. I mean, Gary told you what his undergraduate degree was. I was a math major. I kind of enjoyed math. And I will tell you, you can have, I, I don't know what your majors are, you can have an undergraduate degree in almost anything and be a very successful lawyer. And as a matter of fact, I, you know, a lot of the lawyers I know, you know, have undergraduate degrees in lots of different things. They all can figure out, you know, and they bring various backgrounds and there's a place for everybody. Um, you know, we need people who understand psychology. We need people who understand math and science. They become patent lawyers or IP lawyers. There's people who need to know government. They become government lawyers and all those skills. There's a place, you know, if you know anything about money, economics, accounting, anything, all good degrees um, and anything you do, art, history, even there's a place for those people who have that undergraduate degree. So don't worry. You know, you need uh, the only advice I give undergrads is take one either economics or accounting course. There's nothing in law that doesn't involve something to do with money sooner or later, even if you just want to get paid on your bill. So you should have just a little bit of, of knowledge about, you know, either basic economics or basic accounting, because you're going to have to know, you know, how to count to a hundred dollars or $500 an hour or whatever you bill. Um, and it comes up, I mean, you know, in every field of law, you know, lots of, I don't know, I'm not a criminal lawyer, but I expect lots of crimes involve theft and, murder for making money. And so there's always that aspect. Everybody else, Gary does, you know, um, litigation. He's always asking for damages. People are asking, he's asking for attorney's fees. So you need to know a little bit about money, not, but that doesn't need to be your focus. 
um, whatever your background is, you'll you'll get into law school and you'll be great at it. Um, that's number one. But number two, it, it's a lot easier and a lot better if you actually want to be a lawyer. Um, so that's my recommendation about yeah, I, that. I, I, I agree. I, one of my close friends when I was in law school, no joke, is his degree was in trumpet. He was a musician and had a music degree. And he was working in uh, Disney in one of their orchestras and decided he wanted to go to law school. And he did. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. There's, there's no wrong background for law school. Uh, there are <clears throat> niches everywhere for little specialty practices in particular, if, if doing a general, you know, normal base practice isn't your thing. You know, for example, if, if you've got a passion for horses, there's a whole world of equine law and oh my God, is it complex and crazy. If, if you're into horses, you, you can go do horse law and you'll have a full career doing that. No joke. Same thing. You can pick any subject matter. If you're into cars, mm -hmm. horses, music, art, yep. computers, that's, that's kind of where I got my math background led me to a little bit to computers. I do a lot of computer law and over the years and stuff, but you know, any background you've got, there's a niche and some of the more general principles you learn in any background will apply to being a good lawyer. Yeah. But let, let me use that though. I read a double back on a comment you made uh, early at the start of this, which was that you need a passion for it and you need to be good at it. Uh, the reality is folks, there's no shortage of eh, <laughs> eh, lawyers, just okay lawyers and not so great lawyers, not That's so true. great lawyers are a dime a dozen. And listen, with the rise of artificial intelligence, those people's careers are in serious long-term jeopardy. That being said, there is never, ever, ever enough talented lawyers. If you Absolutely. are a solid student and a solid learner, you will be able to find a good career and a good path somewhere in the law to your liking. But don't be average. Don't be mediocre. Don't settle for anything better than absolutely the best you can be. And if you can rise to a high level and really meet that expectation, not for your only for yourself, but also for your, your clients, you'll have a spectacular career. Okay. That was all one question from Caitlin. Who's next? <laughs> <laughs> and we did not pay her to ask that, by the way, that was, that was not a plant in the audience. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shy people, somebody next. Anything you want to know what we ate for lunch today? I will tell you what he ate for lunch today. I'll start calling on people. Mm. Sophie, in that corner huh i said i see you in that corner ask a sure. question all right well, yes you own well, the microphone now go um, for it you know honestly i'll just kind of talk a little bit about what i was thinking about so um right now i'm i'm interning at the the state senate and i actually um staff the the health committee and we had um a few uh recreational marijuana and medical marijuana bills come through and uh, it was really interesting to me because I had no, I had no idea how it worked. And then I learned that um, something about there's a, there's like, you can't right now apply for like a dual license to, to have both um, medical and recreational customers and something about like, you would have to have two licenses. So there was some sort of bill to combine those two so that you could um, be able to, to get both at the same time. But I wasn't I wasn't really sure how that worked. If you guys know anything about like that that process, I would I would love yeah, to understand because I, I, I think I'm missing something. <laughs> yeah, I can I, can, that I can certainly speak to that. So, unlike a lot of other states, Arizona has caps on the number of licenses that can be issued. Which, by the way, has actually been one of the things that we did really well here. That was a good thing. That's in our statutes, because if you look over the border in California, when they initially got started, they had no caps. So resultingly, you had, you know, two, three medical marijuana storefronts on the same block. And when you've got that kind of saturation, nobody makes money and everybody dies. So all those businesses did really poor uh, and, and they withered and died. And the California cannabis industry is still suffering to this day. Uh, from that. But Arizona limited the number of licenses. So what you were encountering down at the legislature was probably somebody trying to do a few things, inclusive of which was maybe add some more licenses that currently aren't available. So DHS has no ability to add more licenses right now. Uh, but also because we have a wholly separate medical 
versus recreational program because they were both enacted by different bodies of law and those two separate bodies of law still very much exist today. There's a little connectivity between them and they're both run by DHS, but they're separate programs. So if you want medical, you got to get a medical license. And if you want recreational, you've got to get a separate recreational license. But yes, you can have both. And if you have both, you're considered a dual licensee, but they're still technically separate licenses. So it sounds to me like somebody was trying... <clears throat> excuse me, to modify this in a way that would allow the people who maybe came to licensure later to be able to get dual licenses as well. And my example of that is at this moment, DHS does actually have six available medical licenses that were left over from, well, honestly, a decade ago um, from our medical program because several of the original license winners they spent their, their time, they had a three-year residency obligation in the out counties. And three years ago, they ran their time out and decided to get the heck out of the out counties because there's no population there. They're not making money. So, you know, places like Greenlee County with a population of like 5,000 total in the whole county, yeah, you're not making money there. So there is therefore an available spot to open a medical dispensary there. There's a medical license that will issue, but it's medical only. And I think they probably want to have benefit of recreational just to hopefully help their shot at turning a dollar out in that very, 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 very empty county. That makes a lot more sense. You know, sometimes, you know, that that's, that's basically what we do all day. We try to like research those things and find out why, Mm -hmm. why things, you know, like that might be happening. So having extra, extra background is always really helpful. I see Catherine has her hand raised. Did you have a question? Hi. Yeah. So um, I know that you were talking a little bit about how, because cannabis isn't legal federally, that um, companies sometimes run into problems, even if like the state has legalized a substance. Um, I know that um, I'm in an uh, economic development in Indian class, in Indian country class, and it talks about how cannabis companies are starting to look at um, banks that are located on reservations to use because they have so much cash flow in their companies um, to see if they can start running money through banks on Indian reservations. Is that a possibility or something that they should look at? Or does that kind of get messy as you look at um, running a cannabis industry and like it being legalized federally? Ira, you want to start that off? Um, I'm not quite sure where to go with that, other than the general principle is you do run into issues um, in the cannabis industry about um, what's illegal federally. And banking has been one of the major challenges um, for that. For a long time, cannabis businesses were not able to um, deposit their money in the bank because it was illegal and the banks were then engaged in money laundering or similar things accused of that. I know that that's been eased somewhat, and I think Gary might be more up to date on exactly what the banking regulations are. And when you combine that with um, native tribe sovereignty, I don't know where you end up, but I know that that's a complicated issue. Yeah, and I can I can backfill some of that, although I might not have a complete answer for you. So yeah. as Ira's alluded, yeah, the, the, the tribes have sovereign land, they have a degree of sovereignty, so it is in a very real sense, like stepping into a foreign country when you step onto tribal land, but you're not entirely in a foreign country because there's still an overlap of federal jurisdiction. They're still subject to almost every federal law. And there's also, to a degree, an overlap of state jurisdiction. They can be subject to a number of state laws. Now, when it comes to banking, the big impediment is that marijuana is still Schedule One substance per the Controlled Substances Act, which means, by definition, there is no legal trade in marijuana in the United States, federally speaking. We all realize as you go state to state to state, there are very vibrant medical and recreational marijuana programs. But federally, there's no recognition for that. So as a result banks, particularly the federally chartered banks, which are going to be most of your majors or all of your major banks. If Think of it this way. If it's a big bank, it's probably got a federal charter. They're just afraid to touch the money. They want the money. Oh my God, do they want the money. They are desperate for that business. 
But the problem is they're terribly afraid that their regulators will step in and say, hey, uh, you're dealing with money that's involved with Schedule One substances, which means you're now part of the money laundering system of this illegal drug enterprise. And so, Mr. Federally Chartered Bank, we're going to yank your charter and destroy your board and, and cause your shareholders to sue you. Uh, so nobody wants that. This is this is the reason why you don't see like the Chase banks of the world stepping up and becoming the marijuana banks. But trust me, they're desperate for it. They would take it in a heartbeat if they could. So now the Indian nexus to this, the tribes historically had been very, very, very anti-marijuana. Uh, back 13 years ago when Arizona started its medical program, there was this system of um, licensure called the CHA system. It's an acronym for Community Health Assessment Area. It's an old leftover from the Department of Health Services where they were basically dividing the state up into these artificial geographic regions just for purposes of studying disease uh, trends, particularly cancers. Uh, but they had this old system left over, and if you laid that CHA map over the state of Arizona, it really wouldn't look like the cities or towns or counties. It doesn't track that way. Um, it made very little sense, but it's what they used nonetheless. But in that CHA system, the tribes were each allocated so many licenses, and the tribes uniformly said, no thanks, don't even issue them, we don't want them, we won't take these licenses, they won't be available to operate on our land. And their main rationale for that was the tribes already struggle with a lot of uh, substance abuse on premise, and they just didn't want to add yet another substance to an already existing problem. But again, flash forward a decade plus later, they're seeing all of that money and all of the good that that money can bring, and they're changing their tune. So here in Arizona, the tribes are now turning around and saying, you know what? We are going to take those licenses and we are going to get in the biz. So that's starting now. Um, another member of, uh, of actually two members of our, our Cannabis Bar Association, uh, Sonia Martinez and, and Janet Jackham, uh, are both speaking on this, uh, I think, in a couple of weeks. Um, if you're curious, I don't have the details, but just email Caitlin and we'll find it and get you the, the info. Um, but they speak on these topics, Sonia in particular, who is also licensed to appear in front of several of the tribes. So she is extremely, extremely uh, well-versed in this, and I'm sure she'd be happy to come talk to you sometime. Um, but anyway, as far as banking on the tribal lands go, yeah, the, the tribes have sovereignty to start and operate their own banks, of course, but they're still going to be beholden to those same federal drug laws. And I can cite you the example that uh, over the years, and it hasn't been so much recently, but like a decade plus ago, there were federal raids on tribal land for cannabis grows. I don't think they would do that anymore, but technically, because the law is still the same, they could. So if there's going to be hesitation for a tribal cannabis bank, it would be that lingering fear of uh, federal intervention. And just imagine if, like, you know, all of your, your cannabis business money is in one bank. Oh, how easy it would be for the feds to just pull up a truck and take it all. Uh, so that, that would be, I think, the big hesitation. But it's needed. Banking is desperately, desperately needed for the entire industry. And if any of you had been fans of Breaking Bad, there's an episode, uh, I think it's season three, where uh, Skyler takes Walt to a storage facility where they've been piling the cash and there's like wooden pallets with cash literally piled. Um, that is literally what it's been like. And uh, By no means am I exaggerating here. Because these cannabis businesses for many, many years couldn't bank in normal banking institutions, they were literally just stacking cash in storage sheds. Yeah, the, the one that always got me was um, because they couldn't use banks um, and the states were all taxing them, the stories were rife with the marijuana businesses going down and whatever the tax filing deadline was to the state buildings with literally sacks of cash oh, yeah. to pay their tax bills. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I, I've, had, I've had clients who have done that, yeah. for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. just imagine a duffel bag stuffed to the gills with $20 bills. Crazy stuff. All mm -hmm. right, Catherine, you still have your hand Thank up. Thank you. You got more? Or? Oh, sorry. No, I haven't lowered my hand yet, but thank you. That was really interesting. I've always kind of wondered at that in class. Um, it seems like a lot of people knew that that wasn't the answer to some, the problem, I guess. I'm sure that there's, um, I always, I always knew that there was something prohibiting that from happening, but I always wondered what, because yeah, I've learned a little bit about tribal sovereignty and how that functions and works and how it's a little bit interesting underneath federal law. Yeah. Um, 
for sure. Yeah. And, and by the way, yeah. the, the fact that it's federally illegal complicates a lot of things. Now, in the most cases, the federal government just by policy is not enforcing, um, you know, their violations as long as the businesses are in compliance with the state laws. But technically, they could if the you know if there were. A, I mean, it's tremendously unpopular now because the states are making a lot of revenue. But theoretically. There's nothing that prevents the government from going out and enforcing federal law against anybody who's in possession or control of marijuana. Yeah. Can I? By, by the that. way, before we just jump on the next thing, just hearkening back to earlier in this conversation, too, uh, practicing tribal law is one of those niche areas. Uh, a lot of the tribes are very sophisticated and becoming more sophisticated every day. So if, if law is your passion and you're looking for a niche and uh, working for a tribe is, is uh, something that pushes your buttons, oh yeah, you could have a hell of a career doing tribal law. I'm going to jump in and add mm-hmm. to that. Um, so one, ASU has an amazing certificate program that you can add on to your JD to get an emphasis in tribal law. If you guys are still toying around with the idea, but you know that you want to do something in the law, whether it's regulation or something outside of being a practicing lawyer, ASU offers a uh, master's in legal studies where you are also able to obtain a certificate in tribal law. And the master's of legal studies is essentially your first year of what it would be if you were going to law school. Um, It's also really neat because if you are interested in not taking the LSAT, they take, I think it's the top third now, and they throw them in the JD program if they are interested. You still have to make up those 30 credits that you would do in your first year, but it's a really neat way to um, get to law school in a different different avenue if you're still trying to figure out what you want to do. Secondly, um, I don't think that we covered, unless it was during the first seven minutes when I was not here, um, about bankruptcy and how bankruptcy is different um, in Canada because of federal limitations. So I don't know if you guys want to just like oh, that's, give a that, that's easy. Oh, yeah. There's no bankruptcy in cannabis. There you go. No, it gets, seriously, that's it. it. <laughs> that, that, that's the short answer. It gets much more complicated as most legal things do. I've got partners who are... Um, bankruptcy lawyers and so they've looked at this extensively and um generally you yeah if you are in the cannabis business you cannot file bankruptcy some of the issues that have come up is supposing you're secondarily like landlords have gone um filed for bankruptcy one of their tenants is a cannabis business the question is can the, the the bankruptcy court when they take over control of the bankrupt entity the bankruptcy trustee can he take the money from the cannabis business as rent. And there've been a lot of issues about that. And so bankruptcy gets really complicated. Um, and then there is this little known area of law that most people don't know about, but um, under most state laws, you can have a quote receivership, which is a state <laughs> version of a bankruptcy. And there have been a number of cannabis businesses that have been in state receiverships. And it's been a very interesting ride in those cases. I know Gary and I have both been involved in some of those cases. Oh, I don't call them receiverships. I call them cow milkings. Um, (laughs) Yeah, honestly, if if your business, particularly if your cannabis business ends up in a receivership, and what that means, if you don't know, it means a court takes over the operation of your business and puts managers in to run your business for you. You get booted out of your own business and the judge Mm -hmm. runs it. Um, Yeah. Receivers. Oh my God. They are a license to print money. If you think lawyers are expensive, hire receivers. Whoo. Yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) But that, since you can't file federal bankruptcy, that's, you know, when those bankrupt um, marijuana businesses end up in bankrupt in insolvent, then that's kind of one of their few limited options. And it it's kind of a mess. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so I have a question, but I wanted to go ahead and ask a question for Kimberly who sent it in the chat. Sure. She said, I've seen the 13th amendment and the grass is greener documentary on decriminalization of marijuana war on drugs. So I was going to ask, do you think we, sh- we would ever see a complete legalization of it marijuana complete legalization yeah. i don't know what she yeah, means by complete she's legalization saying. you mean literally no regulations no restrictions of any sort of any kind ever anywhere at any time no you will never see that 
not in the United States. No, but it should be scheduled like other medication subject to the FDA and probably be legalized so that it's like other drugs in some fashion. Nobody knows what that's going to exactly look like, but I think the federal government will come around to recognize it as um, to recognize what the states are doing and allow that with some regulation. That's my projection. It's hard to tell exactly, but I think something like that will come. Yeah. Well, there's actually two potential paths. I, I agree. Rescheduling is one path. Um, completely descheduling and just making it its own thing is another potential path. So um, your best analogy to that would be alcohol, because mm-hmm. uh, alcohol is not a scheduled substance, but obviously heavily regulated. Um, there are lots of arguments against and lots of arguments in favor of rescheduling. Those against it would be uh, that you would be still having a regulated substance that would now be under FDA approval, which means marijuana would basically have to go all the way back to the start and work its way through the process of getting approval for all the different uses and things you'd want to put it, which could have a lot of unintended bad consequences. The better move would be just to treat it like its own thing. But right now there is no political will in Washington, D.C. to do anything. And I will also argue that the industry, despite them saying they really want federal relaxation, they really don't. They benefit by its existence. Why? Because they get more control and they also get to point to this thing and call it a luxury crop and charge you luxury pricing. The moment it becomes as common as asparagus, it's not worth very much. Oh, well, I don't know. I think the alcohol analogy is a little different only because we have the repeal of prohibition and that gave all the rights to the states. So there's no federal oversight of alcohol. I can't see marijuana going that way, but it's hard to predict. It's going to be very unpredictable. For for sure. For sure. Um. Okay, so my question, but before I get to that, oh, sorry, sorry. I was going to ask you a question. What was the reference to the 13th Amendment? The 13th Amendment had to do with slavery. Uh, I think she was referencing a documentary. Um, Kimberly, I don't know if you're here. Hmm. Did you want to explain that maybe? Sorry. Well, there's definitely a connection between slavery and cannabis. Most people don't realize this, but cannabis was one of the first crops grown here in the colonies. You know, we typically associate slavery with with cotton, but that didn't really happen until the mid-1800s when the cotton gin was invented. The first 100-plus years of our colonies, cotton was an important crop, but very small, comparatively speaking. Most of the plantations were cannabis, and most of them were populated by slaves. And if you want to see really good examples of this, uh, Thomas Jefferson's plantation, Monticello, in in Virginia, has a very, very, very good website. So if you can't actually ever make the trip to Monticello, just go on the website. They've got uh, original logs of his cannabis harvests and his sales, uh, internationally no less, uh, as well as his extremely vast slave holdings. Um, They don't have specific lists of the number of children he's sired with them, but we know historically he's done that as well. Um, So yeah, there's a very intense connection between cannabis and slavery, but I'm not sure that's what she meant. Was that frightening? Was that too much? Was that intense? (laughs) Well, you've certainly done a lot of work on the history of cannabis. Like I said, I like to read. That's the (laughs) undergraduate degree in English literature. That's what it did to me. Okay. Um, So before I get to my own question, I was just going to say, Mr. Smith, you seem to have a a podcaster set up over there. Do you have a podcast? On, on cannabis. I, I do, <laughs> but, we, but we first have to address why on earth you called me Mr. Smith. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you would have been better. He's really? Be Mr. Polite. Smith? Ah. <laughs> no, Gary, please don't ever, don't ever call me Mr. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is my, this is part of my podcast studio. Yes. Um, okay, if I didn't have cool. the, if I didn't have the cannabis bar banner behind me, which is here, because of you folks, um, there'd be a whole series of shelves behind here with a bunch of fun tchotchkes on it from the exciting world of cannabis. For example, hang on one second. Oh, show and tell part of the day. (laughs) Yeah, there we go. Like, for example, uh, this is one of my two replica Mayan mushroom stones. And if you don't (laughs) know about these, the ancient Mayans 
would carve these figurines. They were found all over Central and South America, and these are actual mushroom figurines from their religious rituals using psychedelic mushrooms. So if the banner wasn't there, you'd see a bunch of stuff like that. Wow, that, that is very cool. That was not my question, though. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask, I don't really know much about the cannabis industry, and I was curious if there's different types of licenses that uh, cannabis businesses specifically get, mm -hmm. um, and if so, like how that works. Sure. Um, so uh, here again, Arizona is different than a lot of other states. Uh, Arizona has what we call fully integrated licensure, meaning you get one license, you can do everything. And there are limited numbers of those. And there's medical and there's recreational. And um, by comparison, a lot of other states fracture their licenses. So, for example, if you just want to be a cultivator, you can go get just a cultivator's license. And that's what you do. You grow. That's it. You don't sell it. You don't process it. You just grow it. If you want to be a processor, you can go get a processor's license. And then you're taking somebody else's grow and converting it into whatever you make it into. And, you know, it goes on from there. You can get a retail license and, and sell retail. But Arizona, it's all integrated. There are a limited number of licenses. So the way the entire industry operates, uh, some corporation will get a license and then will just subcontract the work out. So if you want to enter into the industry without a license, you are beholden to go talk to a license holder and carve your best deal, which right now for cultivators is not that great an arrangement because Arizona has hit a very bad moment of oversupply. So our wholesale market has tanked and these poor cultivators who uh, depend on sales and are not getting the vigorous sales they're, they're needing to survive, they also pay the license holders a monthly fee for the privilege of just being their cultivator. And that can add up to tremendous dollars. The, the pricing for the privilege in this industry, in this state, depending on the size of your cultivator and the deal you carve with your license holder, you're paying anywhere between twenty dollars and $50,000 a month just for the privilege of saying that you're their cultivator before you've sold a single plant. Um, I have a weird personal question. Okay, those curious. are the best ones. <laughs> What's your favorite psychedelic drug? Assuming you take psychedelics based on your background. <laughs> oh, well, we're, we're, we're in public. I'm not going to confess anything other than I am my own favorite psychedelic drug. We have a question in the chat from <laughs> Dennis. Uh, Good deflection, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I got you. Um, he would like to know what your thoughts are on Delta 8. Ooh, that's a fiery question. And how it has been categorized so far. Oh, golly. Uh, Ira, are you dealing with any Delta 8 people in your office? Not yet. Okay. Uh, so for, the, for those of you who don't know, Delta 8 is one of many iterations of delta hydrocannabinol that um, in this particular instance is extracted from hemp, which is definitionally speaking different than marijuana, but we're really talking about the same plant. So let me back up a step and lay some premise. So we've talked thus far about medical marijuana and recreational marijuana, but back in 2018, the federal government passed the 2018 Farm Bill. And one of the things that was part of the Farm Bill that they added for the first time in, in many, many decades was a reintroduction to legal hemp in the United States. And hemp is basically a marijuana plant, specifically cannabis sativa, that has less than 0.03% THC per total volume. So basically, it's boring, lazy marijuana. Um, but the deal is, while you're not pulling uh, Delta 9 THC out of the hemp plant in any significant amount to make a difference, there are tons of other chemicals in there. And one of them is uh, Delta 8 or the precursors to Delta 8. So the hemp industry, which can sell ubiquitously, they're not bound to only sell at retail centers that are licensed as dispensaries. They can sell literally anywhere. Um, they have been making active inroads in extracting and converting these chemicals from legal hemp into active Delta-8, which of course is causing the uh, marijuana industry fits because they frankly enjoy their monopoly and they don't want anybody else getting in. 
So this is a fight that is unfolding in front of us right now. And indeed, at the state legislature, as we are having this conversation, there is at least one bill aimed at trying to clarify and expand Arizona's hemp program to make all of this explicitly permissible. Right now, it's vaguely maybe kind of permissible. And the, way, the reason I say vaguely maybe kind of is the FDA doesn't currently regulate Delta-8. They argue that it's an analog and thus is the same as other iterations of THC, but technically that's not entirely accurate. And notice nobody's been charged yet uh, for any sort of criminal violation, which tells you the FDA is not really sure themselves. But it's a hot button topic. It's going to evolve, I would assume, at least over the next year, possibly the next two or three years. But yeah, it could be a radical change because if hemp can now yield all these same chemicals, but without having to be beholden to the dispensary system, <clears throat> Kitty is mostly out of the bag at that point. So refresh my recollection is, it, but is hemp regulated? Any products derived from hemp regulated by the FDA? Um, if you are going to have things that you extract from hemp that you're making medical claims medical about claims or health for, claims, right. then you're going to stumble into those levels of regulation. But if you're just... Uh, for example, selling an, an isolated or fractionated single chemical and you're not making cl claims about it. You're just, you know, this is my extracted. Right. This is my Delta 8, right? Yeah, there's just a vial of Delta 8. I'm not saying what it is or does. Then I'm not beholden to FDA. Yeah, okay. Yep. And, and, and by the way, the current iteration of Arizona's permissive hemp statutes allow for hemp-derived chemicals but not ingestible. So anything topical, a lotion and oil, you can make from Arizona derived hemp all day long, rub it all over your body, you're fine. Uh, the moment you put it in your mouth, you're in violation. So the bill that's down at the legislature right now is aimed at cleaning that up to make sure that you can not only rub it on your skin, but also on your tongue. Silly, silly distinction, but this is where, you know, good lawyers make all the Brilliant difference. Enough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's there's a there's a, a Supreme Court case that declares pizza a vegetable. That's how good lawyers can be. Um, another question that I know was brought up when I was in um, speaking with you all um, and I was able to answer to the best of my ability. But we have the master here, the two masters, um, social equity licenses. Um, mm -hmm. That was a program that was very interesting for Arizona. And um, I would love for you guys to chat with um, everyone a little bit about that program, what that did um, to cannabis in Arizona, um, pros and cons, anything like that, because um, I'm sure they would love to hear a little bit more about it. Oh, sure. I have nothing good to say. So Ira lead off because I've got I don't <laughs> nothing there to say. <laughs> um, it, it sounded like a good plan at the beginning. The concept was to make sure that some of these limited number of licenses went to people who qualified, um, um, you know, who, who had bad experiences being arrested or other criteria that made them eligible for these social equity licenses. It was trying to get um, disadvantaged people to get some of these licenses because the value of the licenses is pretty large and they're making a lot of money. Um, but what seemed to happen very quickly when those licenses became available was all of the existing um, people in the industry who had been somewhat successful were trying to find a way to double down and were making all kinds of deals with these people who were eligible to apply for the social equity licenses. And that kind of, um, you know, brought out the worst in those businesses and, and really made it look like it was questioning whether the social equity license was going to achieve its objective. And uh, I think a lot of people are, are going to say it, it probably didn't. It was manipulated um, to help the, you know, those people who were in positions of authority or wealthier just find more ways to control the, the industry. Um, yeah. And for those of you who weren't here, uh, could one of you explain what the social equity licenses were, what the criteria was to be a social equity license applicant? Oh, let me take that one. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. <laughs> So I'm just going to uh, pre-apologize for my very dour outlook on this. But the reality is social equity in Arizona was never a real thing. Never. Um, here's the real story. The, the Smart and Safe Act, the 
law that created our recreational program and that also created the social equity program. It was 17 pages of statutes, all one body uh, run as a single initiative and everybody voted for it. And in 17 pages of statutes, I am not kidding you, one sentence created the social equity program in 17 pages, one sentence, and didn't even bother to define what the hell social equity was. So our poor Department of Health Services, who was charged with creating the rules for this program that came with literally no description whatsoever, they did the best they could with nothing. And resultingly, we have a social equity program that doesn't really exist. Now, unfortunately, the voting public and a lot of people who got really excited about the concept of social equity let their imaginations run wild during the election. And uh, all sorts of things were talked about, how great it was going to be. They were going to have this wonderful new, uh, you know, sidecar marijuana program running in Arizona that was going to right all the social wrongs and, you know, correct all the social injustices. And it didn't even begin to come close to starting that. So what we got was a body of rules where the Department of Health Services, and I'm not kidding, decided that if you were going to be a social equity applicant, you had to be or be closely related to a poor criminal from a shitty zip code. That was it. You had to be poor. You had to have a crime in your or a family member's immediate background. And you had to live in just a completely inexplicable list of particular zip codes. That was a recipe for disaster and failure when you stop and consider how capital intensive and insanely complicated these businesses are. And then you have a system set up that says the only people who can apply to run those businesses must by definition be the least qualified to run them. So resultingly, uh, a bunch of smart investors got together and advertised to basically rent a minority. And they put out ads basically saying, hey, uh, sign up with us. We'll, we'll cut you some money. And in exchange, you can be our straw man on the application and go get us that license. And then when the coast is clear, we'll cut you loose and take the license and uh, good luck to you. And that's what happened to most of the 26 social equity licenses. They went to people that you might judge shouldn't have had them. But again, I start or I, I return to where I started rather, we had one sentence in 17 pages that didn't even define social equity. So that's why I say we don't have any social equity program. I don't know what we've got. It's got the word social and equity on it, but that's about it. That's what 30 years in the trenches will do to you kids. Cynicism. <laughs> it was a program that was, I mean, Gary's right about it. It was very poorly defined. And so, um, the people with money and power just figured out you know, I'm overgeneralizing somewhat, but there was a lot of um, a lot of money to be made. And the people who got the licenses were not in most cases, not prepared to deal with what they were being presented with, which was, you know, people throwing money at them to just have you apply for a license and then, you know, agree that we're going to run your business. Um, there were a lot of those deals floating around and, and, I don't know what the end result is now, but I think uh, a lot of those, uh, they, I don't think it turned out anyway the way it was advertised. Yeah, I think if, if you are patient over the next one to two years, you're going to start to hear little explosions go off, and that's the start of the litigation coming out of those deals. <laughs> there will be some of that almost yeah. for certain. Oh, for sure. I, I have already been contacted. So, <laughs> so I'll be doing stuff for the next few years. All right, who else? Anybody oh, else? Going in. You, you guys have we been have a, very, very tepid with the psychedelics questions. Is everybody being shy or? Uh... I think there was one more question in the chat. And then um, after that question, I do want to be um, respectful of everybody's time since it already is um, 730. But um, I know Gabby had a question in the chat. I think this was relating to, to earlier if you wanted to. So, oh, yeah, I mean, because I know that like federally it's not legal and they can come in at any moment. I heard too, <coughs> excuse me, that dispensaries will sell like the bank information of people that come to buy 
there. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I was kind of curious about that. Oh, I don't know anything about that. Ira, any data harvesting going on that you're aware of? Uh, no, I haven't heard about that. Um, and I'm not sure how it will go on. They, they're, I don't know how the, the dispensary would be gathering the bank information other than, you know, they've got credit cards so you can get the credit card information, but all that's usually handled through a third party processor. And there's lots of laws pre preventing everybody in the financial chain from doing anything with it. That's not supposed to happen. Either that or they're coming in and paying cash and nobody's tracing that. Yeah. And most dispensaries don't take credit cards still. The, the merchant banking service companies, uh, most, mostly for the same reason the federally chartered banks are afraid to touch this, right. they're also afraid yeah. to touch this. Which means it's mostly a cash business, and so there's not a lot of bank information to be had. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and also, um, to the extent you might be fearful about federal law enforcement authorities, I don't know the current name of it, but historically there has been a spending bill rider federally that we're talking about, uh, originally called the Rohrbacher Blumenauer Amendment. And it, it's named after Dana Rohrbacher, who's a, a congressperson in California and, and uh, Blumenauer, I don't remember where Blumenauer is from, but it's passed on several times over, over the years. So it's got a different name now, but it stands for the proposition that on the federal spending rider year over year, they have passed this and it says that federal dollars cannot be spent on drug, specifically marijuana law enforcement in states with well-regulated marijuana programs, which is why you haven't seen the federal government come in and raid any of these dispensaries. They're very easy targets. They're not hard to find. And Lord knows they're sitting on mountains of cash, but the spending rider l legally prevents that enforcement, which is why you don't see it. And I know of at least one criminal case where an individual who was federally charged argued this and won. They got their conviction overturned strictly on basis that the federal spending rider prohibited the prosecution. So even if these dispensaries were harvesting your individual data, maybe as like a mutual suicide pact to screw over their customers if they ever went down, I seriously doubt a federal prosecutor would even look at that list twice, let alone once. That's really interesting. Thank you, guys. Sure. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone, for, for coming to the meeting. Um, it looks like Caitlin has offered to, to um, get everybody in touch uh, if they have questions. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you again to... To both uh, Gary and Ira, we really appreciate you guys coming today. Um, it was really, really nice to, to have you guys. I know you, a, a few members already, even even still here in the meeting, messaged me and were like, I never knew. That's so interesting. Like three different members already. So that's, I'm that's sure you will have this. Fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, um, other than that, you know, it is past 730. So we'll see you all uh, next week for for elections. Last meeting of the semester. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. We enjoyed it. Appreciate it so Thank much. You. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community.
Thank you.